<laughs> All right, so to close off this awesome afternoon of presentations, uh, I'd like to call upon Steve Walker, our director for Drupal Interactive, to give us a talk on Art of the Games past, present, and future. So, Steve, can we have you on stage? And while we're all here, I'll turn to the Okay, guys. Um, as you said, my name is Steve Walker. I'm an art director at Drupal Interactive. I'll uh, just give you a little uh, brief overview of ourselves. We are an um, art creation um, provider based here in Bangalore, working mainly in real-time art, uh, focused majority on the video games industry. Uh, but we have had a few experience outside the video game industry, things like theme park rides and marketing and things like that. But I would say the majority of the work has always been in the game industry. Uh, we celebrated our 20th anniversary as a company uh, this year. And in the time of that 20 years, we've seen the industry grow both in its maturity, in its artistic creativity, and in the tech and the tools that we generally use on a day-to-day pipeline basis. So with that, I would like to just go a quick brief overview of the entire uh, industry, where it's come from in the last 20 years, uh, the changing technology, and how that's affected our pipeline and also how new maturity has developed more artistic uh, credentials and where we like to see this going forward in the future. Uh, so with that, can we just play a quick uh, thing about what we are all about at Google? Uh, I'm in charge of all character productions coming out through at the moment. 
So this is a few examples of some of the uh, character-driven work that we do in Ruby. All of this is real time, so I tested images, but uh, all of these could display in a game engine if we needed to. Okay, so what I want to begin with is what exactly is what we say with real time. So today we've had a lot of talking uh, from VFX studios, uh, film studios such as that, and really to understand what real time artwork is compared to pre rendered work. So here we can see two uh, faces. One on the left is from the Logan movie uh, from 20th Century Fox. I think it was a collaboration of multiple VFX studios working on this. And uh, the other one is from a recent game called uh, Hellblade uh, by Ninja Theory. So one is games, one is uh, pre rendered so you can see there is a little bit of difference, I would still say, coming in there. Coming in from the lighting, the shader work, and all this kind of stuff. But traditionally, we've always been seen in games as the kind of younger sibling of the film industry. A lot more basic than what we can see coming out of the VFX industry. And what I want to say, what I want to talk about, is how that, uh, that gap is slowly closing over time. So the main difference, if we look at the two, mod the two uh, images here, that we have to talk about is rendering time. Okay? So we saw with, uh, if any of you guys was in uh, uh, Luigi's uh, work earlier regarding uh, Blade Runner, when he got the, asked the question about how long did this take to render, it's crazy, man. He, you can't even ask that, that question. It was like 60,000 hours. So I think my, my estimation that six hours of frame was pretty conservative on that. I would, and that's probably with a high-end render farm and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, we have to render on PlayStations and home consoles and all that kind of stuff, which are much more uh, mass market and lower end. Uh, but to give you an example, if we say this guy took conservatively six hours per frame, this lady over here is 16 milliseconds per frame. Okay, that's at 60 frames a second. Okay, and we have to hit that expected of this constantly, and it's also expected for us to hit the same or approximately the same quality as the most consumers would see in movies. This gets even more crazy when you have to go into VR. Uh, one thing that Starbreeze is producing is its own uh, VR headset called StarVR. And uh, this is, uh, it's got a larger depth of field than the other uh, headsets on the market. So it wraps all the way around the back of your head and over the top so you don't get the idea that you're looking through a, uh, through a kind of like goggle, as it were. Because of this, we have to go, they don't want to drop any resolution. We have to render at 5K resolution an inch away from your face so that you can't see any pixels. They also want to hit next-gen AAA console titles uh, quality of that. And on top of this, we have to, there's a hard deadline that you cannot drop beneath 90 frames per second. Okay? This is that they were finding that it physically made the viewer ill. Uh, this is because we've got two basically screens refreshing at the same time. As soon as it drops beneath 90 frames a second, which is 8 milliseconds uh, a frame, it makes people feel physically sick. So we have to render at AAA quality, as close to films as we can. Oftentimes, the games for Star VR are at least alongside, alongside films. It's not for home market at the moment. Uh, they have a few installations in the US and LA that place alongside IMAX uh, cinemas. And there'll be like 10 minute, 10 minute, 10 minute experiences uh, just playing alongside film. We had a John Wick experience and we had uh, the latest movie experience as well. Um, so these have to look as close to the films as we can, but we have to re render in 8 milliseconds every frame, which is just not doable if we want to have the 60,000 hour uh, render farm times. So how do we do this? Uh, the main thing that we do, uh, if I had to simplify it, is in VFX we deal with simulation. It's all uh, trying to simulate the world as accurately as possible. We can't do this in real time, so we have to deal with approximation. Things such as uh, we can't ray trace every light, so we have to approximate how the light reacts. We can't, uh, our skin state shaders, for example, we can't accurately simulate how light passes into the skin and bounces out. So we approximate it with a kind of lots of smoke and mirrors, things like uh, Fresnel falls, fall offs, uh, glow uh, illumination, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that kind of com comes through in a lot of the things, really. Uh, things like there is no way we're ever going to be able to simulate hair in real time in the same way movies do. So we approximated with uh, 2D avatars, things like this. Um, and then there's a lot of things that are kind of slowly disappearing as we go on. 
um, normal maps instead of geometry to approximate how the surface looks like, um, down to kind of restricted te uh, texture resolution and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we are, we are getting a lot better. As you can see here, there is, uh, you can see how far we've come in 20 years. This uh, guy on the left, these are all the same character, by the way. This guy on the left is from 1992, Wolfenstein game. And we go through to the same character released this year in the latest Wolfenstein game. We can see that there is a massive change and shift in the technology that is required at the time. Back in 1992, we're still dealing with kind of limited pixels on the screen, no polygons, flat images and sprites. As time kind of came, came around, we kind of switched to polygons, I think you can see in the middle. It's a very, very basic polygon shape. That is. There's, no, there's no surface information. It's just a photograph wrapped around a cylinder almost. And then as we, we, the new technologies came out, sculpting packages, we started to really open up what we could do with the surfaces. And it opened up not just, uh, it wasn't just a case of putting more resolution in what we had before. We could have just made this guy on the left 4K and be done with it, but it's not enough. When the more geometry came out and the sculpting packages came out, suddenly we had the ability to uh, worry about sculpting and form. So we had to stop thinking in the way that we did it in the middle. Uh, where we were just box modeling cylinders and wrapping a photograph around them and started having to behave like sculptors, worrying about anatomy and form and uh, how the light came off the surface. And that's where I'd say a big part of we are in, in the modeling position right now. Um, but it's funny, like when we look back at all this kind of stuff, at every stage of the way, we always think, wow, we've, made we've done such a great job this time. And like, we look at the guy in the end and it's like, I know he's not real, there's a conscious artistic decision to kind of shift him away from the realistic proportions there. But we kind of look at the detail and go, oh, look at the hair, look at the detail, everything. And we've really kind of mailed, made this. And it's kind of funny because we also thought that when we're doing the guys in the middle. And at every stage, we kind of pat ourselves in the back and say, wow, this is great. And it's just funny, I mean, there's one example now from uh, the Max Payne game, if you remember it, when this guy came out, everyone was like, wow, that is like as good as we're ever going to get. <laughs> and like, just going over it now, it's a symmetrical photo wrapped around the, around the cylinder. And really, it's not good enough anymore. When the, the technology has come, has come around, and it's removed the restrictions that we used to have. Okay? We don't have to worry so much about how many pixels we're using, how many verts we're using anymore. But with the freedom that's come, we have to spend our time worrying about more artistic decisions. Okay? Uh, I think this is a great example of that. Uh, looking at the evolution of uh, Lara Croft. Then. Back in the mid-90s, when the first Tomb Raider was being produced, uh, we were still obsessed with, is it possible to produce real-time GD graphics? So we had. I don't know how many votes there are on there. I would say probably about 100 triangles going to one character. And uh, we were so impressed that it's possible and that we can make a collection of birds look like a person. This, we didn't ask ourselves the important question of like, what kind of person does it look like? And so we kind of made these rough caricatures of people, both in the intent and the storyline, and we ended up with this kind of like, rough kind of caricature of what a woman looks like, but not really. And this kind of attitude kind of led us to, led us to look very mature as an industry. And as the, as the technology, as the technological kind of requirements have kind of dropped away and we can use more geometry, better textures, uh, better surface shapes, we no longer have to sit there think, worrying about um, what's the XYZ coordinates of this bird. And we can start worrying about kind of creative decision-making process. And that's what the audience really cares about at the end of the day. Um, we can all, if we look at the lower crop in the middle there, we can all kind of uh, pat ourselves on the back and say, kind of like, think of how many polygons goes into that, think of all the 4K texture resolution that goes into that. But no one really cares. The audience don't really care about it. What the audience care about is, who is this character? How does this sound? 
do we get an impression from, we can already say that, you know, this Lara Croft in the middle, you can see by her, atti by her attire what kind of environment she was likely to run about. Does it tell a story to us in a way that the old, old version just doesn't, it's a character of this? And that's what we really need to be looking at as the technological requirements drop away, we need to replace that time that the user spent as technicians and replace them with artistic creativity, thinking, creating stories, um, and bringing in, um, bringing in artistic um, decision making that was not found in the past. And we can find this from other industries as the industry has opened up and matured. Uh, we've been able to find um, employees and staff with certain skill sets that might not have been available to us back in the early 90s. Things like costume designers, uh, things like uh, fashion designers, hairstylists, all these kind of job roles are, are going to be brought into the industry a lot more. And you can kind of see from the two uh, monsters back on the right, we are still kind of stuck in the creating scary monsters phase of the uh, medium, so we're not as mature as, like, as I'd like to think. But you can kind of see some basic art fundamentals coming into it, into the guy on the right that you might not see in the uh, monster on the left there. Things like asymmetry creating a uh, stark silo uh, silhouette so that the player can easily recognize this guy on the left. Things like uh, color theory and uh, composition of tone and balancing the colors appropriately. And yeah, it seems funny when we look back at uh, some of the stuff that we were producing in the uh, early 90s. It wasn't always technical requirements that forced us into this kind of immature artistic decision making. This is graphic design, box art. We didn't really need to worry about that back then. Uh, this is a game from, um, they were, they're called Reflection of Man, they're now part of Ubisoft and they're creating awesome artwork these days. But back then, because this is PlayStation 1 era, the truth of it is, is because the industry was still young, we couldn't attract good graphic designers. And we didn't care about graphic design. All we cared about was creating uh, the artwork on screen. Therefore, like, when it came to box art, we just rushed the thing out. Now this uh, Burnout Paradise box, this is quite old now, actually. This is coming up to about 10 years old, uh, Xbox 360 years. Uh, but you can kind of see, as the industry evolved, we were able to find more talent, graphic, graphic design, and things that we never even considered uh, as important. <coughs> started kind of filtering into the industry and we were able to produce a lot better artwork across the board. Again, this is decisions made on the creative decision process, not the technical requirements. Okay, so I'd just like to point this out again, as that as the uh, industry evolves, it's all very well to kind of focus on the obvious things that are improving. Uh, things such as the characterization of characters, especially represent representation of female characters, for example. Um, how many polygons you're able to render on screen at any one time. Uh, resolution on textures, resolution on the screen. All these kind of things are very uh, kind of obvious, but they're obvious in a kind of because we're all tech minded. And what I want to show you here now is how more kind of artistic maturity is filtering itself through into uh, the real time artwork. One of the big things that kind of excites me is when I see uh, color theory coming through artwork. It was really great to see all the kind of like color theory coming through in the labor material period. Then. And again, we're seeing this coming through in video games as well. Uh, this is a game from uh, Firewatch, which came out I think, last year. And these color theory is a system that it's been locked down uh, over generations by traditional artwork, uh, using limited color palettes to kind of draw the eye. Uh, draw the eye, form composition. And it's now kind of getting into video games and it, it's kind of interesting because it not only is taking something that has been crafted from everything from traditional painting through to graphic design, through to movie, and now it's filtering into video games, we're finding our own uses for it and how we can kind of put our own unique touch on it. Uh, what's interesting about the top one is complementary color palettes, which is where you would typically use opposite Side of the color wheel. This is very traditional in movies, you see it a lot. Whenever you see kind of like blue and teal in movie posters, that's intentional because uh, it allows you to kind of sell light and darkness while still keeping things very readable and also kind of direct the, the 
viewers' eyes around the image. So we kind of start seeing that in some of the complementary uh, color palette at the top, and it creates a kind of very colorful image uh, without making it feel kind of garish and flashy. Um, and then down at the bottom here, we've got the analogous, which is another form of uh, basically limited color palette, which is where you would take complementary colors all in one section of the uh, color wheel. This will tip typically give like a really dreamy, hazy uh, kind of emotion coming through into the into the image. And this is what I'm getting at. This is bringing emotions into what you see on the screen. And it's not about where that work is. It's not about how much text resolution it is. Think about how to bring emotion into your artwork. Think about how to tell stories with your characters. Uh, think about learn things from other industries. Okay, we've got masses of knowledge of our background. Uh, when we are designing uh, outfits for uh, video game characters, I'm starting to see job roles coming in for uh, costume designers, hairstylists, all these kinds of stuff. It doesn't matter if uh, how many polygons you've got in a hairstyle. If that base hairstyle that you've created is a bad haircut, that's the, the viewer at the end of the day is just going to see it and says, oh, it looks like real hair, but that's a bad hair. That's why we need to bring in, or we don't, it's not a case that we need to bring in hairstylists. We just have to learn from the hairstylists. And one of the big things that I'm seeing is, um, as the technology has progressed, a lot of the kind of bumpy work has been taken away from us. We no longer have to worry about where we go. We no longer have to worry about kind of pixel things and everything down. And that's led to a kind of a freedom that we have. What we need to do is replace those old skill sets that we developed um, as technicians as how to use the software and allow the software to do the job for us and use our time as creators making a creative decision process of how to bring emotion into, into your piece. This is another great example of color theory in games. Um, this is two images from Blizzard who are pretty masterful with the use of color these days. And you can kind of see where color theory is really regressed in the kind of 15 years between these two games. They're both the other. In the first one, I think this was 98 possibly. You can kind of see if you look at that image, it's like where where is your eye going? This is based around composition. Uh, where is your eye initially going? It focuses on the flames, the lights. Uh, mainly because of the contrast between the uh, the, the highly saturated color here and then the whites there. That's immediately where your eye will go to. But at that time, we didn't care. It wasn't a thing that we were, was going through our minds when we were using the game. Because we're still too interested in is it possible to create this game rather than what should we do with the tools. And like really, if you look at that image, forget the resolution, forget anything like that. Like where are the characters? Where do you, where should you look? It's really muddy and hard to create. Compare the same developer, same same uh, series of games onto the right there. You can see a kind of a triad color scheme based around the kind of greens at one end, the purples at the other end, and the hot orange at the other end. This is a pretty basic color palette. But what it really announced that we should do is receive the background into the background, so it's not the focus area. Bring the character in the purple robes to the foreground and bring the action of the kind of hot fireball spell to the foreground and actually guide where the, uh, where the viewer is supposed to look. And again, this is, this is basic composition things that we always could have done, but we just never really noticed it before. And then it's great what you see, um, when we see kind of like technology, when the artistic desire comes through and we, we start worrying about what uh, what's the composition of your scene? And we go to the tech guides and we say, can, can you help us with this? And I think this is a great example of this, again, limited color palettes. What they do in Street Fighter games here is they render a depth pass. And anything that goes beyond that depth pass, they kind of uh, crush the color rate. So you can see into the background, this is on the left, that's basically the tech what's going on. Anything in red is, is declared as kind of foreground. Anything in green gets put down to the back. What we're doing here is we're crushing the kind of value ranges, the saturation ranges, and the kind of range inside the hue wheel down to a certain level uh, of the hue wheel and the value wheel as well in the background to allow the 
characters who have a much greater range of lights and darks and contrasting colors to kind of bring to the foreground. And this is kind of interesting again because it now enables us to kind of bring our own take on pretty kind of like traditional uh, art fundamentals such as composition, color theory, and um, guiding the guiding the viewer's eye around the uh, image. This enables us to then combine it with game design and game practices and bring kind of merge the medium of games with the old traditional fundamental art practices. Okay, so I'm just going to go over the uh, tools of what we do and what's the pipeline for what we would expect. With, again, with a particular focus on uh, character art production. Because that's what really I do at the moment. I'm the head of the character team at Proven Interactive. Um, I kind of discussed about kind of like the tools that have come around recently and kind of how we've adapted to the changing kind of the changing tool set basically. So traditionally, uh, we back in the nineties, we were restricted to box models. When the software, very software, back, uh, sculpting software packages came out, it really revolutionised things. I think these were just coming out when I joined the industry. But I remember the panic in a lot of artists' uh, eyes when they've been so used to box modelling characters, and wrapping a photo projected source around that box model. When sculpting came about, it was like, I don't know how to do that. That's completely new. I need an entire new set of uh, skill sets. And I even saw kind of like some guys, like really kind of like old school guys, kind of almost resistant to saying like they liked it better when they could manually place each bird and there was like a skin in there. And there was a skin in there. But as the new tools come out, it kind of makes these skills obsolete. And we need to move with the time and use it. When uh, the sculpting softwares came out, um, it enabled us to stop thinking of kind of bird herders pushing around collections of birds on screens and start thinking about sculptors. And the old traditional art form fundamentals of sculpting and shape and form suddenly became an important uh, part within the video games industry. Um, and this software really kind of opened it, opened it up to us. I think today it's pretty much part of almost every single uh, pipeline we do. Even if we do kind of real uh, low poly mobile game work, we will always scope things first because it's a much more um, kind of artistically friendly, intuitive way of dealing with shape and form. If we have limited birds, we worry about that after we've got the composition of the form correct. Um, and then this is changing even even so now. We're seeing a lot of big increase in uh, photo scanning, 3D scanning. Uh, and it's actually it's, it's really quite interesting. It's like we had a client who is a pretty major client who works on a really kind of famous pop end kind of series of games. And we've historically worked on quite a lot of the iterations of this game. And uh, they came up to us and said, We want you to work on a new game for us. Can you do the test? We did the test for them. They loved the test, was like excited to work with you. And then they came back and said, Oh, actually, we don't know because we've decided that now we're going to 3D scan everything in the game, everything down to kind of like a rock on the floor, to the characters, to the buildings, or to the cars. Everything will be 3D scan. So where does that really leave us as kind of asset creators? On one hand, we can resist it; be it's a loss for us. The typical response is denial. We see these skills, even down to kind of sculpting skills. Uh, we've developed these over the course of decades to become the best school, the best model uh, that we could make. And then suddenly this new technology comes away and takes it away from us. And yeah, it, it's scary for us. But on the other hand, we can kind of embrace it and realize that it's not really taking it away from us. What we should be again is not software users, but creators. And all it's really doing for us is taking out the donkey work, the kind of time consuming, uh, hours pulling in, just getting in the rough block, block out shoes. You can see something similar to what you're going to get there on the right there. And yes, modelers will always be needed. Uh, anyone who's worked with 3D scanning is known there's a lot of cleanup work, a lot of retopology work that has to be, be done. But the point is that this technology is going to take away the time we would have spent just doing mind numbing, kind of moving things around, getting the base shape around, and let us uh, consider the creative decisions behind. 
And uh, again, it, it comes back into two different ways. A lot of the stuff that we see from the kind of more high-end studios, uh, people working on sports games, for example, where they have lots of players, uh, they will typically have very expensive um, kind of rigs uh, where they'll bring each individual player in, scan them up, and then send us it over to clean up. This is very expensive, and I don't think there is any obvious facility in India uh, to date. However, new software is coming out that we can use it. We actually use Microsoft Connect now in Office, and using two Connects, um, I think K-Scan 3D, that image there is just scanned in using uh, two Connects. So using that functionality, it's very, very cheap to buy these kind of things. We can get a very good approximation of what we would expect to see in a 3D scan out and about, and we can plug these into laptops and walk around the streets and scan things where we see, where we see them. And there is a big opportunity for India especially to get into this kind of market. Um, when we bring it in, let's say traditionally when we were bringing in a character and designing the clothes of it, beforehand we would have to construct it all in Maya or all in Mudbox or anything like that, and then bring it through and reiterate on the design before we can really get to the fun narrative of what the clueless character is. Uh, what we're seeing now is people acting as costume designers. We get a mannequin dummy and we dress the, the mannequin in the kind of clothes that we would expect to see. Um, and having access to the huge textile market that we find around in India really gives us abilities to go out and buy clothes. We go out and buy clothes and we roll around in the mud in them, tear them up with a knife, then we dress them on the mannequin just right, then we scan it, and that gives us a large percentage of the work that we need to do. And all of this process is creative decision making. What clothes you buy, what how dirty it is, what's the wear and tear of it. That's the part that we're doing right now. And it's great as well, not just clothing as well, we're working on lots of kind of typical post-apocalyptic uh, games where you've got lots of environmental assets. There's a lot of kind of old factories around here where they do lots of recycling plants and they've got awesome kind of cars which look like they've been Left on, the, left on the side of the road for, for a year or so in rusty pan machinery. We go into the factories and we, we scan all these things and take it back to our clients in the US. And they're like, awesome, job done. And it's really great to see. So I think there is a big uh, market based opening it up India to what you see around yourself. This is a uh, great example from a studio, uh, Dice, out of the egg. Uh, who this is the first platform, uh, the new ones out at the moment. Um, but what they, a good example of what we're seeing clients behaving from a modeling aspect of the moment. They don't really model anything at all. They go out into the, into the world, they 3D scan rocks, they go into a forest and they scan the moss, they scan the trees, they go to Antarctica, or I guess they go into Canada, um, and they, uh, they scan like ice formations. And then they bring this in and they bring it back into like back into people's living rooms through the medium of video games. And again, in the top right, it's really awesome to see them. They actually went down into the LucasArts uh, costume design and they scanned in all the old Star Wars costumes. And this shows kind of like a level of kind of commitment to what you see. I would love you to you know, get sent down to the Amazon rainforest to scan some trees, and it's much more kind of appealing. To, Choosing which tree I want is much more appealing to me as an art director than figuring out how many votes I need for that tree to look good. <laughs> oh, and then uh, going back into the, into the uh, asset creation process, back still in modeling here, when you don't have 3D scanning, you still have to create things. Marvel's designer has changed uh, how we approach things graphically. Marvel's designer is actually a fashion tool. I'm going to show you literally created for the fashion world to mock up concepts of clothing. And we've kind of embraced it as, as a video games industry. And it's kind of funny because it's, I still don't think the creator of the software knows with, that's what it's kind of getting used for at the moment, but it's uh, really fun to see. And this enables us to very quickly uh, block in clothes. Uh, this is the model that we're using, it's really great. It's not a finished thing. We will then send that into, into a, a sculpting package to work into add the kind of wear and tear of the kind of lived in qualities of the clothes. But it will very quickly get uh, a base kind of flow of the folds. And again, a lot of the guys that I've worked with, and I myself, like spent years learning kind of the art fundamentals of why 
cloth works and falls in a particular way. It's very weird. And how it falls and how it sits on the human figure. And when marvelous designing came out, it was almost like, oh god, this, this, this has automated the process. All that knowledge is useless. But it's not really useless because uh, the knowledge of how cloth should fall enables us to kind of make sure that it's falling in the correct way. And it also enables us that we spend less time reading about you know, how to sculpt this in a particular way so it looks like it's hanging with gravity. And more time reading uh, fashion designers' thoughts on clothing concepts. Go to tailors to figure out if uh, a person's got a particular body shape, how to design clothes for that person of that body type. If you're dealing with kind of like the avant-garde, quite high kind of sci-fi cyberpunk stuff, start looking at the kind of uh, the high fashion world and what they kind of work in, bring in, and how you can uh, produce clothing that's going to complement and look awesome on the human figure. Again, this is creative decision pro uh, processing. A lot of companies are bringing fashion designers to do just this, but as 3D artists, we've already learned such a lot of hard, uh, difficult stuff to learn. This is just one more kind of uh, you know page in our book. Start learning about art, the art world in other industries and how we can bring this into our own assets. Uh, back into the typical uh, modeling process. We still do, obviously, we can't use the sculpts and the high end, high body matches in games. We're seeing right now that in the latest generation of uh, game engines, the, uh, the amount of polygons you have, it's not really that important. It is still a case, and obviously how many characters you have on screen is going to depend quite drastically on how much, what resolution it is. But we're finding now that a AAA game will have somewhere around 60,000 polygons. Okay? A, a, a AAA game where you're likely only to have a few characters on screen, uh, something like the Hellblade character that we saw earlier, is going to have about 100,000 polygons. I think uh, for the for the hair of uh, Horizon, it just had 100,000 polygons just for the hair. So we can see the amount of uh, polygons on screen now, nowadays is really not that important. Okay? And we can kind of get the shape that we want to out of that. But it's really nice to see kind of like uh, Maya and previous Max is, is still the uh, kind of leading competitors, leading software that we have. We find that the vast, vast majority of customers that we have use uh, either Maya or 3ds Max, or we almost entirely use them ourselves as well. And it's kind of nice to see kind of tools kind of getting brought into both, both software packages as well. Previously, there was a lot of, kind of third party software that we would use to do our retopology or UV layouts and all that kind of stuff. And now we have the latest situations of uh, Maya and Max that it's all in the old room, so we can really just stay up, stick, stick to the basics. And then back into the texture characterization creation. This is another thing that's changed drastically over about the last three years. We've seen uh, previous, previous to this, we did a lot of work in Photoshop. A lot of going out, taking uh, 3D sourced images, taking photographs, painting over the top of it. And it took hours, really good. We had to, uh, when you have a scene of thousands of objects, just small objects, tin cans on the road, uh, kind of garbage, all that kind of stuff, and each, has, each one has to be hand painted by an artist just to get that base level looking correct. It takes hours. Uh, when both Substance Painter and Substance Design, and Pixel Studio for that matter as well, uh, Pixel Suite, came out, it really revolutionized how we would approach, approach this. Uh, so, first of all, it brought in the concept of physically based rendering. And again, physically based rendering, when we say physically based, we actually mean like an approximation of physically based. I think what we see in movies compared to what we see in games these days is kind of different. All physically based really means is it's going the light that reacts to a surface is going to react in a really realistic version when compared to what we saw in the old pipeline. Uh, and it's actually a lot more artistic friendly as well. There's less variable that we have to worry about. And what's awesome about these software is that they will generally have a library online of uh, scanned materials that are all scanned using uh, cameras that can pick up various material qualities. So if we want uh, you know, a certain type of steel, we can take it from the library and put it down. And then if that steel is straight up looking correct. If we want denim or uh, cotton or 
even human skin. Uh, we've put it down in the software and we know that light is going to react with it correctly. And what that allows you to do at that point now is previously we spent ages balancing these materials to, to look just right in the engine so it looked like steel. But now we know it's already going to look like steel. So now we can get to spend much more time on the, uh, the fun stuff, the storytelling, the narrative of the asset. What's the weathering? What's the dirt on it? Is there any kind of blood stains or grips or uh, how clean, even how clean it is, is an um, And again, all the procedural, the great thing in terms of the entire game development pipeline is how much this is sped things up. So we can create procedural uh, textures that will, we can decide on an amount of rust, an amount of kind of sand for you at the top. And then we can very quickly procedurally generate every scene, every object in the scene in the correct way, which allows the creator of the scene, the director, as it were, uh, the game designer, to kind of really sell a uh, believable atmosphere where every element of the scene is weathered in the correct way. Maybe there's kind of strong winds coming from the east, and that's affected every object that's in the scene in a particular way. And this also completely links up to Unreal as well, so a lot of times. Uh, the designers and the artists can completely change things on the fly in real time as they uh, as they see it in the end of the house. Which again enables us to act more as set designers. We figure out the entire scene and how it tells the story and less about you know, going to Google Images, taking that and uh, trying to affect the correct specular levels in um, Finally, yeah, back to hair. That hair has been a pain in our ass for a long time. Um, typically, it's something that we've been pretty bad at over the course of uh, over the course of the history of the media. This is mainly because we can't simulate. We can't. It, it will be way too process intensive to simulate every hair on the head, and also hair is kind of semi-translucent the way the way the way light bounces within a hair follicle. Bounces around, passes back out the hair to get a halo effect, and it tends to freak out at the slightest provocation. So, um, yeah, good one for the future. I would expect to see maybe in five years' time uh, this becoming the standard of what we would expect to see uh, hair in video games look like. And it's crazy because it has all the animating properties. It's still not at, at the same point as what we would see in the movie industry, but it's certainly a big increase. I think what we can see on the right there is the version of it off, next to the kind of more kind of original static view of the polygons. Uh, but for now, we are still stuck with polygons, uh, so that's what we make do with. And uh, it was kind of really nice to see in the latest few versions of Maya uh, XGen coming in, which is an instance. Uh, pipeline generation is really good to use in uh, hand. And it has almost completely changed how we, used to, how we do hand. Uh, previous to this, it was either going into Photoshop and relying on the artist to hand paint every hand, hand strand. Or sometimes we would go as far as hand place every, create splines and hand place every single spline. And I think this is what they did for, uh, we're working at the moment with some of the guys who created Horizon. And this is what they did for that hair, but they had a 100,000 polygon hair, and they had to produce splines for every single hair molecule on it, and then render that down. It took, took hours. Like, it was one guy's job for about three years to do that. So now with the new instancing software from Maya XGen, uh, we're able to produce very realistic looking hair in very short amounts of time. We're still reliant on the old alpha card uh, placements of the hair, so it's not follicles anymore. We can get awesome results with the kind of Maya Arnold rendering on using straight up, but unfortunately we have to go back out of that, render it down to geometry. So what we would typically do, as you can see on the right, we would create a few kind of swatches of hair, and then lay them out on screen, and then render that down onto the platform. And that will enable us to create a very realistic hair, uh, looking hair textures, like much, more, much faster and much more convincingly than hand painting it in Photoshop or seeking, uh, seeking uh, photo sources. And we also can do stuff like uh, we can grab death maps from the moment and the inclusion of them. And this will then get fed into hair shakers to really sell, sell the hair. Uh, yeah. This is uh, one character that we have with that icon. This is still just polygonal hair. 
um, straight up textures and polygons. But you can see it's kind of getting there. The only thing that I feel that we're really missing when it comes to this hair is movement. Uh, if, this, if this lady was to shake her head, her hair would be completely static. And that's the big thing that I think simulation will have when we see the uh, when we see the AMD and the game works coming through, we'll see a lot more animation uh, in terms of games. Cool, so where should we go from here? So uh, basically what I've been trying to tell you guys uh, with this talk is that the game, the game industry is progressing at incredibly fast. It's only been around for about 30 years. And in that time, we've gone from Pong to the latest pieces that we have today. Uh, in that time, the technology is always changing. It's always, always changing. The technology will come about, and you might think yourself the best reading model or the best texture in the world. Uh, but there is a good chance, it's almost likely, very likely, that software is going to come out. Uh, we worked on the Force Horizon game. We've had to simulate the entire of uh, Italy's coastline and the entire of the Australian back and outback. That's been dogs not taken to it. Taken to it. Really, the amount of time we can't build the entire of Italy's coastline uh, by focusing on every little bit. We have to allow our software to come in and automate the, the process slightly for us. So that, that can free us up. And we're free to think okay, what's the, emotional, what's the emotions of being on Italy's, uh, on Italy's coastline? What do we want to get across to the viewer? Uh, to the audience, what we want to bring it to, into their, uh, bring this idea of being there in the scene into their living room, and that's what it's going to, that's what it's going to be like. We have to stop thinking of ourselves as software users pushing words around, pixel painting, and all that kind of stuff that we used to do, and start thinking of ourselves as creators, and start taking cues from other industries, be they fashion, be they uh, uh, film. Uh, the traditional art world, the, uh, just anything that you see around you, uh, is we have to start bringing into the, our industry and learning their skills and letting the software do the, do the old kind of industry the job. Uh, so, I mean, just to run it up, what I want to see, what I hope anyway in my job, is I don't want to be stuck at a desk anymore, sitting slaving over a Wacom tablet. It's fun, I like doing it, I'll, I'll probably do it even even there. I still like, uh, I've got friends who still do pixel uh, pixel paintings that they're back from the days of the 80s and love it. And that is a great skill that's completely obsolete now. It'll still be there, it won't go away. But what I really want to see as an art director and as a creative is I want to make the choices to go out into the wider world, find the, the environments, find the people, find the characters, find the personality, the guy who walks randomly down the street who I think has got the correct face for the character. I want to be taking those creative decisions to bring that in and bring it all into the experience and quality. Drive emotion and hard quality and not technical side of things. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Steve. Really appreciate that. I think that was an amazing talk. Um, I mean, running a little short of time, I'm very happy so many of you actually stayed back this late for uh, the talk to get completed and for our sessions to get completed. Uh, so if in case you have any questions for Steve, we're going to be here offline maybe about for the next 5-10 minutes. Do feel free to come up and catch up with us rather than us holding everyone back. Uh, before you leave, uh, maybe present you a small token of appreciation from our end. So, Here's a small moment. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to the end of all the sessions that we had for media and entertainment. I know it's been a long day, and I know it's been an exciting day for me. I could sense the energy uh, in every other room that I really went to, right? Uh, how's it been for you guys? Just, just by awesome, awesome, great. Thank you so much. Thank you once again for being here.